So benefits from, from inflation, well, if the lenders are hurt, that means the people who borrow the money therefore can benefit. And again, back in the 70s, we can have an example of this. Again, go for that 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And let's say back in uh, 71, 72, uh, you got something like a, maybe 72, a $300 uh, monthly payment for your mortgage, which is probably typical back then. And that's a fixed rate. So I don't know the rate is, but whatever the monthly payment is, it's going to stay the same each and every month for the next 30 years, no matter what happens to inflation. So again, let's go to 1980. And so what I did is I, I want to see how much that $300 is worth in 1980 dollars. And so I divided by the CPI for 1972, and then I times by the CPI for 1980, which we used in the prior lecture for uh, Stan. And so paying $300 in 1972 is the same as paying $591 in 1980. But by 1980, what is this person actually paying? $300. So you're paying really $591 in $1980. When you get to 1980, you don't pay the $591, you pay the $300. So just like Stan's income was cut in half, this mortgage payment was also cu almost, uh, almost cut in half as well. So that's the benefit of getting a fixed rate loan. In real returns, in real, uh, in real terms, each and every year, the burden of that loan payment goes down. The next group that are benefit are employers. And employers understand the real return concept. And so again, if your nominal pay increases with 2%, they can make the employee happy. Say inflation is 3%, so the employee is happy, they're getting a 2% pay increase. Inflation is really 3%, so the employer has not really given a pay raise. The employer has cut the pay by 1%. The real return is negative 1. You take the nominal return, 2%, subtract 3% from that, the real return is 1%. This is a clever way that employers can cut workers' pay without the workers knowing it. By doing that, they're doing what's known as money illusion. Money illusion is when people make decisions based on nominal values, not real values. So if this employee feels, oh, I'm better off because I got a 2% pay increase, that's money illusion. Because your pay has not been increased in real terms, it has been decreased. After you got the 2% pay increase, your pay buys less than what you had the year before. And again, understanding real return, real values, can, make you, can have you make better decisions. What this person should do is go to the boss and say, look, you're trying to give me a 2% pay increase. When well, inflation is 3%, you really should, should, uh, should have given me how much to get a 2% real return? 5%. 5% minus 3 will give you a real return of 2%. So the employee should go to the employer and say, hey, boss, you really should give me a 5% pay increase, so that will allow me to have a 2% positive return over the rate of inflation. And that's not guilty of money illusion anymore. Next, we go look into the causes of inflation. And there's two main causes. One is on the demand side. This is by demand increasing. So demand increases, you get higher prices. And so if you draw supply and demand, Price quantity, supply demand, equilibrium price and quantity. And now if demand increases, we get higher prices. Which is not too bad if there's a slight increase in demand. But if it happens in many areas with large increases in demand, especially when it gets to the point where supply can't increase anymore, once you get to an a, a, a amount where they can't produce anymore, then you just drive up prices. So if demand increases dramatically in many markets, you would get a spike in inflation in these markets. And that can be quite inflationary. Moderate inflation is caused by demand increasing, which is, is, is pretty much you know, uh, pretty okay. You know, prices rising about 2% a year, we've said, is not a bad number. But when prices starts rising dramatically, we've had a too much, we had, we had demand increase by too much. And this usually is caused by the government borrowing from the central bank. And when the government borrows from you and I, there's no new money out there. If they borrow my money, well, that money was already there. If they borrow a bank's money, that money was already there. If they borrow from the central bank, we're going to find out later on, that's new money. And whenever the central bank buys uh, debt from a bank, 
uh, back up. Whenever the whenever the uh, Fed, uh, central bank buys government debt from the uh, U, from the government, they are doing what's called monetizing the debt. They are turning the debt into money. And turning the debt into money can do this. Zimbabwe, we have a one hundred trillion dollar bill. Probably could buy you a cup of coffee. So the main cause of this kind of inflation, which is known as hyperinflation, which we talked about in chapter five. Is caused by the central bank monetizing too much of the debt. There's another picture from Zimbabwe, a starving billionaire, sort of you know, billion dollar notes there. And then we have the same problem in Venezuela recently. This is looking at uh, two, uh, 2018, where we have inflation that is 27,365%. 27, at that point, your currency is destroyed, no one wants it anymore. Uh, you have uh, people start to return to a barter system, trading goods for goods. Use another country's currency, maybe use uh, U.S. dollars. Uh, you can use um, European euros, Japanese yen, but this has destroyed your own currency, and this causes economic devastation, which is the case of Venezuela right now. Another kind of inflation is cost push inflation. This is when you have higher production costs, put pressure on businesses to increase prices to cover the higher cost. And we have a moderate amount of this normally. Uh, demand for, say, concrete goes up, you get a little bit higher price there. Demand for steel goes up, higher price there. So typically we find this in the system, uh, the macroeconomy, but in the macroeconomy uh, tends to uh, be able to deal with this uh, usually. And so normally it doesn't cause uh, a, a big problem unless it's really drastic throughout the uh, um, macroeconomy. Here again, it's not consumers doing it. It's on the cost side, the business side. And so severe cost push inflation is when you have costs rising all across the economy, and that can lead to lower production as consumers cut back on their purchases, which can lead to an increase in unemployment. And so if this happens dramatically throughout the economy, you get sort of a double whammy. Supply and demand. This is caused not by demand, but by supply. And so here we're going to have supply decrease. It shifts to the left. And this is your cost push inflation. You get higher prices right there, P2. But you also get lower output. At least with the demand side inflation, we at least got higher output, more jobs, if we had a slight increase in demand, slight inflation. Um, slide inflation does not destroy your currency. If you have hyperinflation, that can destroy your currency, which is, is, uh, can really, again, devastate your economy. If this happens in one market, two markets, it's not a big deal. If it happens across the entire economy, most of our markets, then it becomes a big deal. And that's what we had in the 1970s. We had a huge increase in the price of oil. And oil back then was even more important than it is now. Uh, we had very little few economy cars. Uh, most of our power, electricity, was, was uh, produced by uh, burning oil. Oil was everywhere in the economy, and we're using it everywhere because it was cheap. Until the 70s came along, and due to political events, we had a huge increase in the price of oil in 1973, and then again in 1979. And what that did is decrease the supply in most of our markets, drove up prices, and then it also led to lower output. And it led to a new word called stagflation. Stagflation is a combination of inflation, higher prices, and a stagnant economy, lower output. And so we're seeing higher prices and higher unemployment at the same time throughout the 1970s. And that caused pretty much uh, a lot of pain and suffering. And the reason why uh, we really couldn't deal with that very well is that we do have our tools of fiscal monetary policy, but they're designed to work on one problem or the other. Uh, they're, they're designed to work on a recession or inflation, not both. If you have recession, then the government can do things like increase government spending. To try to get the economy out of the recession. But by doing that, you're adding more demand to the economy that can feed to higher prices. If I now increase the demand over here, we get even higher, uh, more prices going up. So you're going to lead to higher inflation when inflation is already high. 
prices are rising 9, you know, 13 percent a year, and you're going to add more inflation in the system, not a good idea. So let's try to uh, work on the inflation side. Well, government can do the opposite. Government can decrease spending. But that would create more unemployment. Right now, unemployment is already high. We had unemployment that was at 5, 6, 7 percent. And now you're going to find the government spending is going to go down at the exact time we need more jobs. So this time, demand would move the other way, go down, and we're going to add even um, uh, less output out there and more uh, unemployment. That's not, accept that's not acceptable either. The only real solution to the problem of the stagflation was to reverse the cause of it. And the cause of it were higher oil prices. Well, the solution is get those prices down, and that's exactly what we did. So both President, Presidents Ford and Carter in the 1970s uh, pushed through initiatives to make us more energy efficient, to lower our demand for oil. And by the end of the 1970s, 1980-81, we did that. Our, our oil consumption by 1981 was much lower than it was at the start of this crisis in 1973. Okay, so that is inflation. I have to talk about economic growth in um, chapter 7, and that will be the last topic for chapter 7.